Well, good evening, Hobart. Um, it's really lovely to be here um, for the truth of it live, um, although we call it that, but in truth, it is in fact an elaborate lockdown evasion scheme, um, which uh, a couple of us on the ACL team have cooked up to great effect, because every time there's a lockdown, we manage to hop the border just in time. It's quite remarkable how that works. Um, but actually, I'm glad it's brought us to Hobart, because every time I do one of these, you know, you're often in a different city or a different state, and you're always obliged to say something nice about the place where you are. And it's not always really easy to say something nice about some of the places where we end up. I'm not naming any in particular. But I will tell you this this evening, no word of a lie, Tasmania is, other than Queensland, and you've got to give me that because I'm from Queensland, other than Queensland, Tasmania is my favourite state in Australia. So I really, really am pleased uh, to be here. Now, this is the end of quite a number of events. Uh, we're going to have a two-week break after this, so I'm running low on gas, so say a prayer for me so that I can get through this. But what I wanted to do this evening, over the next 40 minutes or so before the Q&A, was spend some time tonight giving a little bit of a diagnosis of our culture and then asking the question, you know, what shall we then do? And what I mean by diagnosis of our culture, of course, is that I want to look at what are some of the key beliefs that are driving our present age the key doctrines, if you like, of this present moment in Australia, indeed in the West at large. And there is a place in the Bible which gives us a really, really insightful analysis into that very question. And the place in the Bible is Romans chapter 1. It goes through with remarkable insight the doctrines and beliefs of our age, which is interesting because it was written about a very different age, it was written about an age which was a pagan Roman Empire's age. But of course, people sometimes forget that there's actually a great deal of similarity between that time and the present time. A lot of historians, a lot of analysts, a lot of philosophers are increasingly starting to call this a neo-pagan era, as opposed to what was then what we know as a pagan era. I mean, the, uh, the, the similarities actually ab abound um, we all know that it was uh, really of that era that the phrase bread and circuses was coined uh, to reflect the fact that people were basically satisfied with bread and circuses. Uh, we have the Circus Maximus and that is as big as pretty much any modern stadium. Um, and today I am really, I've been really grieved actually looking at the exit, particularly from the COVID lockdowns and things like that, to see what's been prioritised. It is interesting to me that one of the first things to reopen was the footy. Um, and in places like Queensland, where I'm from, we've now got this current controversy around the fact that they allowed the football players and their wives in, but people who need cancer treatment and so forth are not allowed in. Really interesting insight into priorities. You know, I wish the priority was the church, but alas, we don't live in such a time. You know, there's some similarities, there's others as well. We've been lamenting at ACL a passage of a range of laws around the country. It actually began here in Tasmania, I think, uh, and then ACT and then Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, all followed suit in due course. But we have a situation where there is abortion to the day of birth now fully legal right around most of the country. So a child that is viable, that is capable of living, that is living, that is capable of surviving independently, can be killed in the womb right up to the day of birth. Well, see, there was another time when Christians were concerned about this sort of practice, and it was in ancient Rome. What they used to do, of course, was discard infants in the hours after birth on the rubbish tips of the city. And the Christians became known as those who went and found them uh, and raised them as their own. Uh, there's a sense in which, you know, we look back at these practices and we think, wow, what barbarism. Well, do you know, in the New South Wales State Parliament and other state parliaments, laws to render medical aid to children born alive and capable of surviving have been voted down. So that if an abortion doesn't go to plan, they simply leave the child to die. Now, that is happening dozens of times every year in this country. The statistics from those states that keep those records show as much. We're no better than they were. Or you can look at something like this. Prior to uh, effectively the 21st century, 
the only really recorded instance of, say, a same-sex marriage in all of history was Emperor Nero, who married two boys. The one he called his husband, the other he called his wife. Here's another thing, in ancient Rome, and I'm in, I've been reading some stuff by uh, a few people, and in ancient Rome, some of you who are familiar with the era may be aware of the fact that it was the Christian community that were the social outsiders in a very big way. And a major part of that was that they didn't participate in temple worship, they wouldn't light the incense sticks and they wouldn't be a part of that community. And of course, that was the hub for community in that era. And so they became people who lived a little bit on the fringes of community. And a whole bunch of rumours were started about Christians, and you may have read about this. For example, the notion that they would eat, eat the body of Christ and drink the blood of Christ, right? Communion. And so all these rumours spread that these were cannibals and they were having feasts on human flesh. Uh, or indeed, they, they used to call the, um, the, the worship services, the, the, uh, the communion services that they did, they used to call them love feasts. And they say, oh, these people are dreadfully immoral, they're engaging in orgies and all sorts of things. And the rumours became more and more insane. It's fascinating to me, you know, in this day, um, there was actually an article printed about our Truth of It Live event in Perth, uh, which was very successful. And in the article that was printed, it was in one of these, um, uh, one of the gay newspapers, uh, a good one that actually often reports well, actually. Um, but nonetheless, in this newspaper, there was a quote from someone, and they said, well, we don't want the ACL in Perth because they are well known for their network of underground churches in which they practice medieval experiments on children. I thought, is there another ACL? You know? I mean, we laughed at ACL, we thought, this is insanity. I mean, I don't even know what planet this is, but the fact it was actually printed. I thought, we're not surely getting to this stage, are we? And I saw a tweet the other day from somebody with quite a number of followers, uh, who tweeted an article about one of our campaigns and said, well, let's not forget that these are the people who marched alongside those who blamed the Jews for 9-11. And I thought, huh? What in the world? Where does this come from? But let's get something a little bit more mainstream. Um, there's a number of campaigns around the country at the moment to pass these laws and I think Christopher mentioned it in his little segment, they call them conversion therapy laws and of course the reason that you might do that is because it becomes very hard to speak about them and critique them uh, because of course if you're seen to be in favour of conversion therapy, well you're a very evil individual. But of course here's the thing, conversion therapy of the kind that is conjured up in the mind of the average Australian coercion, uh, abuse, you know, electric shocks and all this sort of stuff. I mean, hello, it's not happening in Australia today. It's not happening. But of course, that's the thing that's in the mind of the average person. Of course we should ban this. Of course we should get rid of it. Of course this might be practiced. You know, there's a, there's a madness in people's minds around what might be going on in these Christian communities. And it's so far removed from the truth that it sometimes isn't even funny. We don't do those things, we would never do those things. Here's the thing about conversion therapy, by the way, you know that conversion therapy is not invented by a Christian as a phrase, because conversion is an act of God in a life, therapy is what we do to each other as part of healthcare. You can't therapize someone into conversion, it just doesn't work. So, you know, it is in itself a misnomer. But Paul writes from a society, there's just some of the traits. He writes from a society like that. And he writes about what it is that's driving this culture. What are the doctrines and beliefs that lie behind it? And you know, what he writes has an awful lot of credibility and relevance, not just in pagan Rome, but in neo-pagan Australia. And he writes and he says, well, what is it that makes this culture tick? And in verse 18, he, he puts this verse, which comes across very firmly, he says, well, actually, why don't I, you know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to read it, because that'll just put us in the picture. I'm going to read it from verse 16, I'll read a few verses, and then I'll go through it. He says this, and by the way, he starts with this note of great optimism, he starts with this great answer in verse 16 of chapter 1, he says, I'm not ashamed of the Gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, or the non-Jew, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, 
as it is written, but the righteous one will live by faith. And then he says this, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident to them, for God has made it obvious to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, that is, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived, being understood by what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honour Him as God or give thanks, but they became foolish in their reasonings and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible mankind, of birds, four-footed animals and crawling creatures. And I just want to read verse 25, he says, they exchanged the truth about God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. It's a very stern passage and I want to get to the answers in just a minute, but first I want to unpack the points that he makes. We read there this, first of all, he says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. This is the first point he wants to make about this culture. Do you know, the hallmark of this culture is truth suppression. And the way this is phrased in the Greek is such that it speaks of something that is an ongoing effort. When I was a kid, I used to swim in the pool and I'll never forget, for some reason, I had this fascination with trying to get these volleyballs that are extremely buoyant to touch the bottom of the pool. And to hold them under the water and not risk getting an uppercut when this thing breaks through the surface, it takes a fair bit of ongoing effort. You've got to rebalance and re realign yourself and hold it down. You've got to continually do this or else it'll pop to the surface. That's really what this is conveying. It's an effort to hold the truth down and truth has a habit of trying to make itself known. It has a habit of confronting us when we turn left and right and all the rest of it, but we must keep it down. Now, this is evident in a range of ways. I want to say, firstly, it's evident as a day-to-day -day reality. What are the two taboos in Australian culture? The two things that you shouldn't talk about at dinner parties or in polite company? Politics, someone's around, I can hear people saying it. Politics and religion. Let's not go there. Let's not have those serious conversations. It's not kosher. Here's another thing. Wendy and I were just talking backstage um, with some of the security guys uh, and talking about their work. And it just got to the point where we we're talking about the alcohol culture of our time. And I had something to do with this when I was working at a big law firm uh, in Brisbane. It always blew me away, you know, you would be sitting there in the day and, uh, you know, as a junior lawyer, it's not a very exciting universe, let me tell you. Uh, sorry to the lawyers in the room. Uh, but sometimes you can be sitting in the four walls of a white room <laughs> with no windows, you know, doing discovery or something, going through binders and binders and binders of documents all day long. And you can go half mad. And the most exciting thing that happens in the day is that you go out for lunch. And, you know, you'll be sitting there talking about what your lunch break's going to be about for about two hours before it happens. Oh, I'm getting sushi today. Woohoo! Uh, and that's the most exciting thing that goes down. But then, of course, you get to the end of the week. And one of the things I just did not understand myself, and I still can't, is that towards the end of the week, these strung out, busy, distracted people, you know, 10 to 5, the bottles of alcohol start coming out of the fridge and they don't know who they are from Friday afternoon to Monday morning, rinse and repeat. And Monday, they're all full of stories about where they ended up, what they lost, what they... And I used to think to myself, what is going on? How do people live this way? Do you know, they will deny it to their dying day, but there's something about that pattern of life that is suppressing truth in unrighteousness because it avoids serious thinking. You know, entertainment is numbing the senses to what is important, what is deeper, what is more meaningful. It is ensuring that you don't focus on any of that stuff. And so people go through life. And there's not, you know, I even saw the other day in the news, um, Canberra's in lockdown at the moment, as you know, and that's where I live. Uh, there's such a shallowness out there at the moment. Um, one of the buildings in Canberra, they lit up the side of the building with, the, with, a, with a love heart. 
and then the, the letters underneath CBR, just by turning on certain lights in the building. And it was written up across all the Canberra newspapers as a message of hope for Canberra, sending good vibes to everybody in lockdown. I thought, that's hope. A lighting engineer, for marketing reasons, turned on a few lights, and that's hope. There's no depth here. I mean, there is such a thing as real hope. That ain't it. Um, the avoidance of the serious, the avoidance of the deep, the avoidance of reckoning with ultimate questions. That is a hallmark of our time. And if you want to lose friends, start talking about those things, because I don't like it. But it's not just an individual thing. This is a public square thing. When I was doing the Human Rights Law Alliance, the law firm, one of the things I realized was how true that passage is in Isaiah 59, where it says, truth has stumbled in the public squares. And then it says, and he who, who speaks the truth, or he who departs from evil, it says he makes himself a prey, he's going to get pounced on. And I see that in cancel culture all the time. I see people who are pounced on, whether it be the foster couple that we're helping, because they've been barred from the foster system, because they were quizzed about their religious beliefs on SOGI issues, sexual orientation, gender identity, or whether it be the academic from the University of Sydney that we helped because she gave a talk at a school and she's a Christian and she's uh, an expert in sexual health and she gave a talk and what did it say? Well, actually she included the, the Christian view on these subjects, God's order for desire, for example, how to serve God with our desires, and then she gets threatened with her academic status at the university, she gets booted out uh, of uh, one of the professional bodies that she was a part of, or whether it's the bloke who gets drummed out of his uni because he prayed with a friend, with her permission, but she thought better of it and reported him, and he got told he'd made an unsafe university space. Time and again, cancel culture, cancel culture, all the time. And I used to think, I used to think that this cancel culture thing was about freedom. And what we were really looking for was freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of expression. Because people were being cancelled for expressing themselves, for speaking. You know, Israel Folau is a classic example. The real problem with Israel is he talked of judgment. And people didn't like that. People got very upset by that. It's not one of the doctrines of our time, it's one of the counter-doctrines to our time. And he got cancelled in a very big way. He didn't get, he didn't get criticised, he didn't get uh, responded to with further speech, he lost his livelihood, he got drummed out of the, 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 the football, the um, NRL and, the, um, and Rugby Australia, effectively for the rest of his life. Pretty full-on reaction, pretty full-on response, cancel culture. Was it freedom? I'll tell you this, I've since realised by simply looking at all these cases as they came across my desk and as they come across now the desk of John Steenhoff, who works at the HRLA, and as I see them come up, every time I tell you, 99 times in 100 they fit this test, it's not freedom, it's truth. It's the truth that's cancelled, it's the truth that's attacked. You know, the school teacher who walks into the school and says, kids, you know what, you could be a non-binary, two-spirit genderqueer, they never get cancelled. They don't go to court, they don't go to the tribunals, they don't go to the Human Rights Commission. It's the people who go in there and say, well, actually, the these, are my these are my beliefs. I believe God made us male and female, and that's our calling for our lives. And that to conform to God's creation mandate is the best thing we can do. That's the problem. <laughs> By all means. <laughs> um, there's, there's other examples too. I mean, uh, one of the things that shocked me was that in, in, in New South Wales, uh, the pro-life group Emily's Voice, uh, which are a very uh, gentle and appealing sort of outfit, uh, and they run very soft ads just to bring the reality of human life um, in the unborn to people's attention. And they put up a billboard and it said, a heart beats at four weeks. That's all it said. Um, and the New South Wales Transport Minister had it taken down. And he said, because it, he, said, uh, he, said it, uh, he said it threatens to make people feel guilty. And I thought to myself, you know what, that is a statement of scientific fact. It's the truth. A heart does beat at four weeks. Now, fine, if you want to have the argument, so it doesn't matter, have the argument. But why cancel it? I'll tell you why I cancel it. Because truth doesn't mind analysis because it will be exposed as truth. Lies don't like analysis, because they are exposed as lies. And the reason cancel culture even needs to exist is because it is insecure about the fact that it's built on lies. And if it is truly analysed, then it will be shown for what it is. 
And we live in a time when cancel culture is weaponized against truth. Very seldom, very seldom against lies. There are a number of legislative moves in our time as well. I just want to mention that conversion therapy legislation. The thing that troubles me about the Victorian law is that it reaches into the family home. And basically, the problem is that if a parent now encourages a child to wait and just does that simple act, which is not unwise, by the way, um, and I was called out for this on ABC Q&A, but I went away and did all my fact-checking, and it's absolutely true. Every study that they've actually done, which looks at children who experience gender dysphoria pre-puberty, and then looks at them again post-puberty, every study ever done has a greater than 72% rate at which the child with gender dysphoria reverts to their biological sex identity, uh, up to 92%. There's been a, a recent amalgamation of all the studies done, and it comes out somewhere in the 80% as an average. Now, that's a perfectly reasonable thing, but it reaches into the family home. Why? There's another law that, was tried to, that they tried to pass through the parliament a little while ago. It didn't reach into the family home, but it reached into Christian schools. It would have made it impossible for Christian schools to prefer staff that shared their faith thereby meaning they're no longer a Christian school, because that's what makes a Christian school Christian staff. I thought to myself, why are these areas being focused on? Why, why try and undermine the integrity of a Christian school? They're not trying to undermine the integrity of any other political movement who are allowed to employ people who share their values. And why try and undermine the family home? Here's the thing, Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, he says that we should pray for kings and all who are in authority. Why? Well, ultimately, so that they might ensure that godly lives are lives of peace, so that the truth is on display, because God desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, right? So the government, by its laws, can ensure that the truth is free. We've just seen that. The government, by its laws, can ensure that godliness is uh, a state of peace for people, so that their witness can be seen and heard about in a society. What's the inverse of that? Well, you can have laws that are set up against the knowledge of the truth. It's interesting, at my Christian school, there's a lot of people who went through high school and they weren't Christians at the start, but they were Christians at the end. There are two pastors of major churches in Brisbane who came from my Christian school who were not Christians when they started. They were converted at school and through the witness of the school and now they're pastoring churches. I can't help but think this is an opposition to the knowledge of the truth. Of course you undermine those areas if it's truth that's your target. Of course you undermine the Christian home because that's the last place of safety for a child to be trained up in the ways of God. Now I say all of this to make a simple point. There is a spiritual dynamic in all of this. Uh, I was actually saying at the Truth of It Live the other night that the whole, you know, Jesus made this point, he called, he called Satan the ruler of this world. There is a spiritual dynamic at play and we see here that the connecting tissue of all of this so often comes back to opposition to truth. The Apostle Paul says this is an age of opposition to truth. It's interesting, you know, and I'll move on with this point, but it even is played out in the ideologies of the day. Uh, you think of an ideology like postmodernism, which really got a hold through the 60s, 70s, 80s in particular. People came up with it before that, but that's when it got a hold. Uh, one of the best descriptions of postmodernism I ever heard was that it killed the author. In other words, truth is not something that's authored by a higher power outside of ourselves. Truth, rather, comes up from within us and from our own subjective experiences. What does John 1 say? It says there is a great author. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were made through Him and by Him and without Him nothing was made that was made. It says, you know what? All reality stems from one great source. There is an author. There is a great truth. There is things about this world that are fixed and unchangeable. Postmodernism reversed the system. It said, oh no, I'm the author. My subjective experience creates truth. And all of a sudden, we're not in a situation where truth is honoured and believed in, we're in a situation where the best we can say is that there is such a thing as my truth. You hear that so often these days, people say, 
to me sometimes. I'm so, you know, encouraged that you stand for your truth. I'm sitting there thinking, why does that encourage you? My truth can't possibly have any impact on you whatsoever, because it's only mine. So it's not encouraging, it's nothing. The reality is there is a truth. Except when you hear that phrase, your truth, it actually leads us into the second doctrine that the Apostle Paul points out about his time and our time. Verse 25, he says, they exchanged the truth about God for, and the Greek is actually, the lie. So this is the greatest lie of all. They exchanged the truth about God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. I want to make this point. The ultimate creature worship is the worship of the self. And there is no more contemporary statement than that, what Paul has just written. This is not ancient Rome, this is Australia. It's an ancient statement, it's a modern statement. It's actually, it's the timeless sin of the human race. Look at Genesis, when Adam and Eve look at this fruit and it's desirable to make one wise. And do you know what the phrase that's used there, what they're thinking? It says, it is desirable to be as gods, it says, knowing good and evil. In other words, no, God doesn't get to say what's true and what's right and wrong anymore. I do. And that's the desire. It's the timeless sin of the human race. Do you know, I heard a great example once. You imagine that there's a planet somewhere in outer space and these aliens are very advanced in their technology and they know about planet Earth and they know that it's populated and they decide that they're going to send a, a, a research mission to Earth. And that research mission, those researchers, those alien scientists, they've got a bunch of questions to answer. And one of the questions they have to answer is, what do these people worship? And they come down in their UFO, and they disguise themselves as humans, and they integrate into normal life, and they watch TV, they get on the YouTube, they look at all our billboards and our marketing, they engage in conversations. And you know, they might see, they might go to a gym, and it might say, be the best you you can be on the wall. Or, you are beautiful, believe it. Or they might go and read the newspaper like I did the other day and there was a profile of a very successful woman in there. And I don't want to get into the detail of, you know, she'd been recently divorced. I don't, don't, not getting into the detail of those circumstances, but her reason interested me. And I've heard this many times. She said, I just needed more for me. For me. So I divorced at the age of 29. Or they might see the prevalence of uh, phrases like self-love, self-esteem, self-confidence, self-care. They might see motivational speakers telling you to be your best self and surround yourself with people who champion you. And they might see all of your selfies on your Instagram account. And they might sit in a year five classroom and they might see what they're doing now with this new federal government program that they've funded where they're making identity posters and they're putting together their own identity, and the teachers are saying, well, here's some attributes you might want to feed into your own identity, just by the way, and they write their little identity poster, and this is who they are, and now they've got the meaning of life. They've got to live this out. What do you think the conclusion of these aliens might be? When they go back to the mother planet, and they have filled out their survey, what do these people worship? It would say, these people worship themselves. That's what it would say. There's cultural cues of this all around us. And I've just mentioned uh, several of them. And you know, as a result, some of the greatest sins according to our culture. You know, every doctrinal statement needs to identify what some sins are. Here's a sin, judging. How dare you judge? How dare you find a fixed standard and apply it to somebody? How dare you say there's a truth and they're in contradistinction to it? Well, of course they're not, they're the truth don't judge. Now, interestingly, whenever Jesus said, don't judge, and this is in, do you know, don't judge is not even a complete sentence when Jesus said it, there's not even a comma after judge. Judge not that you be not judged, for the measure that you give will be the measure that is given to you. In other words, don't be a hypocrite. Now, that actually is more serious, because it means everything you say will come back at you. And the thing about the human nature is, we're very good at seeing others clearly, but very bad at seeing ourselves clearly, right? 
And that's the point Jesus is making. Get the beam out of your own eye before you touch the speck in your, friend, in your brother's eye. That's the very next verse. But then, of course, the next verse is, don't cast your pearls before swine. Well, who are the swine if I'm not supposed to judge? Well, you can make wise conclusions. You can do that. Um, it's not what Jesus is saying at all. But man, people say, judge not every time. The reality is there is a fixed standard of truth, authored by God Himself. And yet judging is a sin because our culture denies it. What about this? There is a law here in Tasmania, section 17 of your Anti-Discrimination Act, which says that you're not allowed to say anything that offends somebody on the basis of certain attributes. Can I just ask a question, what in the world is wrong with being offended? I thought that was character. Because some things are meant to offend you, and you're supposed to react and respond to them and grow and develop yourself. Some things that might offend you, you can measure and analyse and go, do you know what, that's actually wrong. So I'm confident I'm moving on with my life. See, the thing about this law is that not only is it that subjective, that someone can simply be offended and connect it to an attribute that they may profess from their identity poster, not only does it do that, but there's no defence for truth. You can't say, well, I said something that was true, Because the law itself is devised by people who don't believe in truth. And if you offend a person's sense of themselves, that now is a sin. It's interesting, you go back enough decades in this country and there was what we call blasphemy laws. I'm not necessarily asking that we bring them back, but I just want to make this point. A blasphemy law basically made made it so that it was illegal to insult God. We don't have blasphemy laws anymore, they've been repealed. But you know what we do have? We have laws like this one. It says, no, it's not God that can't be insulted, it's my sense of myself that can't be insulted. Is there not a great reversal that has taken place to ground what is true in me? I am the truth. And that is the meaning of my life. Can you imagine what this does to the way a new generation reads the Bible? Either the Bible is the thing which we receive with meekness, as James says, we submit ourselves to it, and its authority, and we change ourselves in response to it, or you say, well, I don't like that verse, I'd rather read this one, and it bounces off you, it has no effect, because fundamentally, you're not submitted to anything, because you've raised yourself up to be in that position of creature worship. You are objective truth, or you imagine how this changes the way we live our lives, this kind of mindset. There's a lot of people out there who, you know, this is, this is one way in which I think we're often deceived. We can live our lives in genuine submission to God. Or we can live our lives in this complicated way of saying, well, I am serving God, and because I feel like I want to do X, that must be God's will, and I prayed about it, so it's fine. In other words, you're doing what you want to do, and you're claiming God's approval. Because you're not actually submitted to that which is outside of yourself. You're playing God. You're in that position. This really does have a serious effect on our very Christianity. But this goes further. This goes to the extent, firstly, that we do decide what is right and wrong. You know, Isaiah 5.20, woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Uh, That's the situation we're in. People, how often have you heard the phrase, it was right for me? Nothing could be more irrelevant than whether it was right for you. Because we'll get to you in a minute. It's not all good. But here's the other point I want to make. Romans 1 is one of the most controversial chapters in the Bible because it is one of the places where Paul explicitly mentions homosexuality uh, in some detail and he goes there. And he goes there right after this verse and I've always wondered why? Why does that just get thrown in there? Why does he do that? I'll tell you why, because he's just made this point, he said, you've denied God Creator, and then you started to worship yourself, and guess how far you've gone? You've made yourself the Creator. You're redrawing the boundaries of creation itself. And in his day, one of the greatest examples of that, of course, was homosexual practice. Why? Well, without going into detail, creation testifies to us what our bodies are for, right? And this is outside of what the clear creation design for our bodies is. And so, Paul is saying there's something revealed to you by God in creation, 
and you are acting outside of it because you think that your will is more important and superior to God's very creation order. Now, we're seeing this in many ways today, not just that, we're seeing this in a whole range of different things. So, for example, um, you know, I could, these days, if I say, well, I identify as a woman now, uh, and I'm six foot seven with hairy hands, but I'm a woman and I'm beautiful, uh, and you'll say so, otherwise I'm offended and I'm suing you, uh, we're actually in that scenario. Every cell in my body has got chromosomes that say, man. Not only that, but you can't actually change your sex. You talk to someone like Walt Heyer, people, or Kira Bell, who Christopher mentioned, people, and there's, I've talked to a lot of these people who are on the other side of this stuff, uh, and they've realised what a terrible mistake it was, and of course, for many of them, it's got lifelong scars and impacts of a really grave nature. Uh, and you talk to these people, and they say, well, I didn't feel like a real man before, I certainly didn't feel like a real woman afterwards. Is that not obvious? Of course you don't, because your body is not female. It can't be. You can change it on the outside, you can dress it up, you can take bits off, you can add other things, but it's never really going to change the inherent nature of the thing. But actually the ideologies of our time attack so many of these creation things. You know in creation, that was when God said, very good. And so the things that God said were very good are the creation blueprints for our lives and for this world. And these are things that are very good for all people, not just Christians. And of course, they were once uncontroversial because they were quite clear in creation itself. And of course, creation itself is made by God, therefore it's good, and therefore we adhere to it. But today, creation is under attack in a whole range of ways. It is firstly under attack on the sexuality front. Where was sexuality designed? In creation. A man and woman were not themselves by themselves, not good for the man. First thing that wasn't good was the loneliness of Adam. And so a woman is made for him, and then the two are supposed to become husband and wife, and God make, and Jesus quotes that in the New Testament. And says, well, that's why people get married. That's God's good design. Where does gender identity come from in the Bible? Well, there's only one gender identity that's in God's design. He says, well, you've been made a male or a female, and so there's a calling on your life. You may feel differently. Don't get me wrong. Everyone feels different. People have all kinds of desires. The human heart knows no limits in what it wants, and what it seeks after, and what it looks for, and what it feels like. But the point is, there's something clear about us in creation that God has put there. And He said, well, you designed a man, that's your sex assigned at birth, well, then you're actually supposed to be a man. And He actually describes in that very good Genesis environment some of the qualities of a man and some of the qualities of a woman. Or you can look at something like the abortion thing, life, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, where's that? In creation, which is very good. Or, you know, for a long time, we've had uh, some attacks on the issue of work, for example. Work is good. Policies that war mitigate against people being industrious and working, like universal welfare, not good. Because people are meant to work, that's part of creation itself. Man was working in paradise. Or what about the race thing at the moment? You look at something like Black Lives Matter and it's based on critical race theory, which says what? It says that actually if you say race doesn't matter in the sense that we should be colorblind, in the sense that we're all one human race, right? And that we're all equally uh, saved in Christ Jesus, we're all equally human, that's white supremacy. Because you're denying the lived experience of people of other colors. And race does matter and we are irreparably divided against each other and all we can do is slowly repent of that and try and make amends. Now, that really is the summary of Robin D'Angelo's book, White Fragility, which is one of the key texts at the moment on this stuff. There's no answer. It's just we've got to keep trying, we've got to keep getting better, we've got to keep repenting of our whiteness because we're white supremacists and that's the end. Well, guess what? Creation says there's one race. Melanin concentration in the skin is a trivial difference. We are all human beings made in the image of God. Every one of us Christ died for. Every one of us has the same standing and the same salvation before God, no matter what. And in Revelation, there is every tribe, tongue and people and nation, all there together singing God's praises. And that is the greatest equality in the world. Creation's under big attack, right? It's amazing to me how that, I almost, it's sad because I kind of realised that before I realised that's what Romans is actually teaching. I saw all that and went, what's going on here? These are all creation ordinances. And then I thought, bang, 
It's exactly what Paul says. Do you know, in every era, the culture around us is so often just the suit of clothes being worn by Romans 1. These features are always there. A lot of people, they go years into study of philosophy and all the different ideologies that are out there, and that's all very helpful, and I'm not saying that's a bad idea, and I've been helped by doing those sorts of things. But it's amazing to see the wisdom that comes out of Scripture. But we have gone that far. Not only do we go our own way, over God's way, but we redefine God's way by changing what is right and wrong, and we will even redefine God's world. And we think we're going to get away with it. We don't get away with it. You know, we're dealing with some real sadness at the moment. I look around and I just see news story after news story after news story, report after report after report, which says that people are in a mental health crisis. People are on a downward spiral. I have family who are in the health, uh, in the health field, and one of the biggest things going on at the moment up in Queensland is a spike in suicides among 13-year-olds, 12-year-olds and 14-year-olds. What in the world is that? 13? Suicide? And completely unexpected. And the reports show time and again that the next generation is in serious, serious trouble. Do you know why? They don't know they're up or they're down. They're left or they're right. They're right or they're wrong. They have nothing. They have no boundaries. They have no clarity. They have nothing to live by. It's just you and whatever you like and it's chaos and it induces massive anxiety and they are depressed. We are not okay. That's why it says in Romans 1, it says they receive in themselves the due penalty for their error. What he's trying to point out is saying this has consequences now. I mean, my heart goes out to Kira Bell, to Walt Heyer, to Andy, a young fellow who emailed me recently to tell his story. I tell you what, it make you cry. Look at my video uh, about that on, on, on YouTube. Dreadful, dreadful, dreadful scenarios because adults put them through this because they got the ideas put in their heads at school and no one stopped them. The world is in trouble. This is the day in which we live. And of course, if we listened to Jesus, we would have known that this would have happened. Because Jesus actually made the very clear point that far from being the thing to pursue for your life and the goodness for your life, that which comes out of your heart ain't so good. You need what is of God which is outside of you to come into you, not to look within and bring it out. You know, Jesus says this in Mark 7, and another hard passage, it says, that which comes out of the person, that is what defiles the person. For from within, out of the hearts of people, come the evil thoughts, acts of sexual immorality, thefts, murders, acts of adultery, deeds of greed, wickedness, deceit, indecent behaviour, envy, slander, pride and foolishness. All these evil things come out from within and defile the person. Wow, how's that for an identity poster? Goodness gracious. Why is it... Actually, that's probably... A, anyone got a kid in year five doing an identity poster? It's probably a good verse. <laughs> Here's the thing, we as Christians know something. We know that we're sinners and we're saved by grace. And we know that we need to be filled full, not of ourselves. You know, when I was a kid, the insult was, you're full of yourself. It was a good insult, actually, uh, because it really pinpointed the problem. It's not about you. We need to be filled full of Christ. And that's why when Jesus talks about the qualities of the Kingdom of God in the Beatitudes, where does He start? Poor in spirit. You know that in yourself, you've got poverty. And then he goes, what's next? Well, he says, you know, you're, you're, you're meek, you're submitting to something outside of yourself. Your strength is found in your submission to God. And then what happens? He says, well, you're hungry and thirsty for righteousness. If you're hungry and thirsty, you want something to be put into you, don't you? And so it goes on and you're filled full and that's the promise and so forth. The Beatitudes follow this, this pattern of emptying and filling, which is God's plan for our lives. Now, I've gone very freestyle and I just need to find my spot. Um, <laughs> uh, oh yeah, I just want to make this simple point before I, 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 I just conclude with, a, with a, a what shall we do sort of segment. But I just want to make this point. The Apostle Paul uses here the word fools a few times. I just want to make a point. We trivialize that word, like foolishness is just silliness. But actually, in the Bible, foolishness is very, very serious. In the Bible, foolishness actually is 
It is, it is the willful and the negligent, so we should know better, negligent and willful actions of a person who has denied God and stepped out of His way. That's what foolishness is. And that's why he says here, people think they're wise, but they're being foolish. They're fools. And the answer is, of course, that God's reality is so obvious. How obvious? Well, it's this obvious. It's as obvious as the fact that this building we're in is not the result of an explosion in a brick factory. Um, He says, God has clearly made Himself known in creation. Everyone can see it, especially in a place like Tasmania. It blows me away, you know, some of the most beautiful places on earth are some of the most, a- most atheistic places on earth. I'll never get my head around that. I look at a sunset, I look at, I went hiking at Cape, is it Cape Hay or Hoy or however you say it? And then, um, Hoy? Cape Hoy, there you go. Should have asked a local before I got up here and made a fool of myself. Um, well, you know, you go out there and you just think, you just see God. Complexity doesn't come from nothing. You don't walk on a beach and see a word sketched in the sand and go, ha, look what the tide did. You think, oh, there's someone around, don't you? I mean, this is how crazy it is. And we've got layers and layers of scientific complexity to tell us that we're idiots for thinking this. Mate, I'm not stupid, you're stupid. It is so obvious. And the Apostle Paul just makes that point. He says, the reality of God is a reality that everyone subconsciously is facing every single day. And actually, once you see the reality of God, you realise that it's not from within you, but it's from outside of yourself. And when he comes to, uh, eventually, Romans 12, to answer this conundrum for us, the readers, he says this, well, actually, he makes a point here about the Gospel, Romans 1.16. He says, there's really only one single answer to all of this, and it is the Gospel. It is the work of Jesus Christ to bring salvation into the world. And that's why he says, I'm not ashamed of the Gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And we need the power of God in a day like this, uh, because it's pretty hard to shake someone out of this kind of mindset. They need to see God, they need God's power. And Paul says, there's one place where you'll find that power. It's the message of salvation in Jesus Christ to the world. He says, so I ain't ashamed. This is the world I live in, I'm not ashamed. Now, why would he put it that way to say, I'm not ashamed? I think it's because he knows something. He knows that we have a tendency to be ashamed. We have a tendency to think that what we, what we carry and what we know to be true is somehow hateful, is somehow hurtful, is somehow bigoted, is somehow something to be walked back from or walked away from or something that we shouldn't proclaim too loudly lest people get upset. It's the power of God for salvation. The world doesn't need less, it needs more. It needs more. It doesn't need shy and retiring Christians with this truth, it needs people who will speak it and live it boldly and loudly. Because our world is crying out for it. And it's interesting how he describes the Gospel. He says, the Gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. When was the last time you heard the Gospel described that way? Oh, that's the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Nobody says it that way, do they? But against this dark backdrop, isn't that actually a wonderful statement? Because surely if this world needs anything, it needs the righteousness of God to be implanted in human souls, doesn't it? And they need to be able to see Him by faith. A good description of faith, not a definition, but a description, is that faith looks to God. It's amazing, really, to see that the Gospel turns a person out of themselves to look to God and to see God and to know God and to live in that posture of faith and actually for His righteousness to change them from outside of themselves. Not only to save them in Jesus Christ, but actually to transform and change them as well in the way that they live. This is ultimately a spiritual crisis. And that's why Paul says, you know, what's the problem? It's ungodliness followed by unrighteousness. People have forgotten God, so they've forgotten His ways. And here's the answer, it's the Gospel. It's the Gospel. And by the time he gets to chapter 12, he makes this point. He says, therefore. Therefore, it's a great word, it means in light of everything that I've said. And everything that he's said so far from chapter 1 through to chapter 11 is what? It's theology. There's barely a statement in there that we ought to do something. He's just talking theology, theology. This is what the world, this is the righteousness of God showing up the condition of the world. We just read that. And then he talks in chapter two and three, the righteousness of God showing up the condition of your human heart. 
and that's quite serious. And then in chapter 4 and 5, he says, ah, but the righteousness of God is available to you by faith in Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 6 and 7, he talks about how that actually the righteousness of God can start to change you from within, can sanctify you, can make you better, and can actually make you live for God. And then in chapter 8, he says, ah, but either way, the righteousness of God in Christ is what will save you, because there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 9, 10 and 11, he does a historical analysis and talks about God's righteousness in history. We'll park that for a second. The point I want to get to is this, chapter 12. And I want to get to chapter 12 because he then says, therefore, and all of a sudden, every statement is a do this, do that, be like this, be like that. He says, in light of the mercies of God, all these mercies of God, all these things that he's done in this gospel message, he says, you know what? Do something do something. And there's this crazy notion um, that, I, that I come up against all the time in Christian circles. And it is, you know, why would you go out there into the public squares and not just preach the gospel? And people have this strange dichotomy in their brain, like the gospel's in this box and then everything else is in this box. And then you've got the other extreme where it's all social gospel and there's no evangelism. That's wrong too. Here's the thing, the Apostle Paul's not done talking about the Gospel for 16 chapters. He goes on forever. And the thing is, he goes through all the things I described and then he says, and you know what, the Gospel is also this, it's the righteousness of God shining forth in your transformed life every day. And he says, therefore, he says, make your very life, he says, make your body a living sacrifice. In other words, make the life that animates your body every single day an act of worship to God in everything that you do. And in all things, he says, you make sure that that living sacrifice is holy. In other words, it's not conformed to the kind of world that we just thought about, but it is truly distinct and different. It's not polluted by those things, we haven't dwelt on those things, we haven't entertained ourselves with those things, but we've been serious about killing sin in our lives and living for Christ and having personal holiness and integrity. Make sure, he says, and if you do that as a holy, living sacrifice, that is an act of worship for God. And he says also, this is your reasonable service. In other words, be holy on the inside and be serving on the outside be doing things continually. And it's interesting, from chapter 12, he even goes as far as talking about your relationship to the state. He's talking about your place in society and he's saying, make sure that your service is daily and it is always grounded in the Gospel. It is the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ, your transformed life, shining out through your every deed and action every day. And here's an interesting thing which is culturally counterintuitive. Where does it begin? He says, renew your mind. He says, be transformed in this way by the renewing of the mind. Now, I want to just mention this before I finish, because the mind really is the gateway to the whole person. It's mind gate that transforms the way you feel. It's mind gate that transforms what you want and how you live and your desires. It is mind gate through which God changes and reaches the person. Now, I say that is countercultural because it really is. People think it's all the feels, you know, it's all, it's just about having an experience uh, and hearing God speak to me subjectively and going and waving my arms in worship, look, all those things, I'm not criticizing them but what I am saying is there's something greater and it is the transforming of your mind which will transform your whole person. That's hard work. That doesn't happen by osmosis. We've got to be busy about that. We've got to be getting our thinking right. And you'd be amazed as your thinking develops, as your understanding of the Bible develops, as your understanding of Jesus Christ develops, how it changes you. It comes in through the brain. And I want to make this point as well. When we go into the world and we serve God in this way, from integrity, from holiness, and we're serving God every day. That itself spreads the Gospel to all people. I was amazed and I almost hesitate to say this because it sounds um, like I'm tooting my horn and I'm not, but I want to make a really important point. Somebody said the other day at a conference uh, uh, and they work for a leading evangelistic ministry in Australia 
And they said, they said, the ACL is the most effective evangelistic out outfit in Australia. Now, I don't know if that's true, but I'll tell you why he said it. Because they know, because they talk to so many people who call their hotline and email their service and all the rest of it, who tell their testimonies and explain their journey of faith. And our videos and our content come up continually, continually. As I travel around for this Truth of It tour, I meet people regularly who say, I became a Christian because I saw this. I became a Christian because of these videos. I went on my journey of faith, or this was a crucial moment. Now, why do I mention that? I mention it for this reason. You'd be amazed at how God will use the things you do in His name, in this world, to reach people with even the Gospel itself. Because people, the evangelistic effort is not done until people get to Jesus Christ. But you'll be amazed at the avenues through which they find Him. And they find Him through the Christian family and its integrity when they see it, they think that's beautiful, what's going on. They find it through the Christian in the workplace, who they know and they identify and who stands out. And they say, what is it about him or her? They know it through the Christian in their university class or the five Christians they've known over the last 30 years who have all had something about them and it speaks to them or the video they found on YouTube that met them in their... It was, even if it's an issue that's controversial, there's one guy on the phone with one of our... Um, one of our supporter relations ladies, uh, and he was a gay man, and he found a video of the truth of it about homosexuality, realised his error, and ultimately became a Christian. That's pretty phenomenal stuff, right? And we can have confidence that Jesus' promise becomes true when we are these kinds of people in this world. That actually, he says, when your light so shines before men, they will see your good works, and they will give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And I want to encourage us today that God is still at work, even in this world, no different to Paul's, very much the same, the prescription is always equal, it just needs this sleeping giant of the church, all of these people, to go out there and do what we're called to do, and God's work will indeed advance in our day. Thank you very much, that was the truth of it. Uh,